We're all familiar with awkward moments, and some of us have probably had awkward moments when we tried to point to Jesus with people. But we've all had the, the things that everybody experiences. Like, you know, when you, you wave because a guy's waving at you, and then you're like, oh, <laughs> he was waving at him. Those awkward kinds of moments that we all experience, or perhaps some of you have accidentally ended a work call going, uh, bye-bye, love you. I uh, didn't mean to say that. We know how that goes. Or when you still don't understand what the person said after you've asked them to repeat it three times, and what do we all do? We go, yeah, <laughs> yeah. These are awkward moments. Witnessing can feel awkward. Sharing Jesus with other people can feel awkward. It can be inconvenient. It can be uncomfortable. It can be with people that we don't feel like we have a real connection with. I mean, how many opportunities to share Jesus have we passed up because we wouldn't risk feeling awkward? I'm hoping that this morning I can encourage you a little bit, even exhort you to embrace awkwardness when it comes to sharing Jesus. Because if you wait until it's not inconvenient, if you wait until it's not uncomfortable, if you wait until it's not awkward, you'll die having shared Jesus with no one. Because it's always a bit inconvenient, uncomfortable, maybe even awkward. I think awkwardness is the biggest threat to evangelism. This feeling, and you know, we live in a society that avoids awkwardness at all costs. We see social memes all the time, you know, that awkward moment when. You're all familiar with side-eyeing Chloe. I'm going to show her right now. Can we put her up there on the screen? Yeah, right there. How often have you seen that face, right? So I made my own meme with it. Is awkwardness not a small price to pay compared to what God wants to do in and through you? Is, is, is a few moments of awkwardness not a small price to pay? Even an hour of awkwardness not a small price to pay compared to someone's eternal fate, if we're honest? Now, you might be out here this morning, and you heard all that introduction, and you're thinking, it's not awkward. I love to share Jesus. We're thankful for you, but you're not normal. All right? I am. I'm very thankful for you. But that's not the norm. So I want to encourage you this morning. Could we embrace the awkwardness of sharing Jesus as a gift from God? Here's why. Because when we enter that moment and we feel a bit awkward, we're going to have to fully depend on Jesus. It's like it's a gift. It's saying, you know, you had nothing to do with the good news in your own life. This was a work that I did in your life. So how about enter into this awkward witnessing moment recognizing that I can do for you what you cannot. Embrace it as a very gift from God that we would depend on him to do for us what we can't do in that moment because we're depending on him to do for that person what they can't do. So the very gospel that is going to save them is the very power that will enable me in this moment to share. Witnessing is not always easy. So I want to go to an example in Acts chapter 8 of Philip who is going to show us some things about witnessing. Acts chapter 8 verses 26 through 29 to start with. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, And was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So he's made the journey to where God told him to go, and this chariot comes by with the Ethiopian in it, 
and God impresses on his heart or speaks to him, somehow he knows this is what I'm supposed to do. Go over and join this chariot. New Living Translation of that same passage. Go over and walk along beside the carriage. Okay, that's awkward. Here comes this carriage. I'm like, you know, walking beside the carriage. It'd be like if, it, if some sort of diplomat was passing by in a limousine today, and God said, I want you to jog beside the passenger window. I mean, let's put ourselves in this, this picture. This is a bit awkward. But God is impressing on Philip. This is what you are supposed to do. Now, the backstory. Philip has been itinerating all throughout Samaria. He's been sharing the gospel from town to town. John and Peter have come up there to see what's going on, and now they have gone back to Jerusalem, and Philip has probably taken a rest after that. And God says, hey, I want you to go down to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. Inconvenient, likely uncomfortable. Most of us don't want to get up off the couch to do something like this, let alone travel what I was estimating could be anywhere from 40 to 50 miles. Get up and go to Williamsburg today on foot. I've got something I want you to do there. Has God ever convicted you in a moment? Has God ever, like, you just feel it, like, you, you know, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to say this. I feel like God wants me to talk to that person. Have you ever had the Spirit lead you in that way? And if he was, was it inconvenient? Was it uncomfortable? Maybe a bit awkward? Was your schedule interrupted like Philip's? But it seems that Philip was able to view this interruption as an opportunity. Where did Philip learn that kind of perspective? This is an interruption, but hey, it's what God wants me to do. This is an opportunity. I think he learned it from Jesus. He spent a lot of time with Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew tells us in chapter 14, there's this moment when Jesus hears that his cousin, his dear friend, John the Baptist, has just been beheaded. And Jesus is like, I need some time. I just need to be alone. I want to process this. Matthew 14 As soon as Jesus heard that news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. We understand that. We understand why he would have wanted that. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. And Jesus, he saw the huge crowd and he isolated himself further. He ran and hid. No. He stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them and healed the sick. You think this was an inconvenient time for Jesus? (laughs) Certainly it was. Was it uncomfortable? Did he have to rise to a challenge? Certainly. Philip saw him do this. So in this moment, when Philip's schedule is interrupted by God, he can say, you know what? I've seen this before. This interruption is an opportunity. Mark, when he starts his gospel, writing it, in the first three chapters, you can count, there's like 35 interruptions of Jesus. Opportunities. Opportunities. So Philip is willing to be interrupted because he learned it from Jesus, and Jesus had compassion in those moments. He had a heart for the people that were interrupting. So your schedule may be interrupted. And the context that God calls you into may very well be uncomfortable. Because we are often called into, if you remember from the first sermon in the series, into people's wilderness, where we're going to point to Jesus. 26, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then he adds, this is a desert place. This is a wilderness Philip's not just being called into a geographical wilderness. He's being called into the topography of the wilderness of this man's life. He doesn't know that yet, but this is what he is walking into. Philip obediently enters into the confusion, the disappointment, and the wanderings of this Ethiopian man. 
Yes, it's inconvenient. Yes, it might be uncomfortable. But Philip's going to do it. And he's going to go to a person that's not really like him. And that makes it perhaps even more uncomfortable. If God calls you to witness to share Jesus with a person that's not like you, you may be intimidated, like, who am I to share with this person? Or you may be nauseated, <laughs> like, who is that person that I would share with them? So it may be a person not quite like you. Peter addressed this just two chapters later in Acts 10 when he said, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Philip obviously knows this. He's like, I'm not like this guy. But here is a man who is trying to do what is right. And I can point him to Jesus. So if God is accepting of any who will come, who any who will listen, how could we not? This man that Philip is going to minister to is an Ethiopian eunuch. He's from the, the court of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. He oversees all the treasury. So this is a, a high-standing diplomat. And Philip's like, man, I'm just a blue-collar worker from, from rural town. <laughs> but I'm going to share anyways. Now, likely the Ethiopian started as a lower-class servant and sacrificed his future of any potential family to attain the position that he's in, much like many Americans who are willing to sacrifice marriage and family to gain higher career positions. Shouldn't keep us from sharing with them because I can guarantee you there's still something missing in their life, no matter what they've attained in their career. There's still something that says, man, this didn't fulfill what I was looking for. So the inconvenient, uncomfortable moment Philip enters into, and what is his response? He runs to this person, and he discovers that God was already working. Imagine that. God is already working in this person's life. So what do we learn from Philip? First of all, before I mention those things, I just want you to realize Philip is a guy who lives for Jesus. We see this over and over. He's the one who led Nathaniel to Jesus. He's the one in John chapter 12 who two Greeks are asking about Jesus. He's like, let's go to Jesus. He's here in Acts 8 spreading the gospel throughout Samaria and now witnessing to this Ethiopian. And wherever he went and shared Jesus... There was joy. After sharing Jesus in Samaria, you read in Acts 8.8, 8, so there was great joy in that city. At the end of this passage, you can see that the Ethiopian will leave rejoicing in verse 39. There's something about Philip's way of pointing people to Jesus that leaves them joyful. I love that. <laughs> That we wouldn't just be dogmatic and argumentative, but when we're done sharing Jesus, people would at least go, well, that was pleasant. <laughs> I really enjoyed listening to him, hearing more about what he believes or she believes. So here, two things we need to learn from Philip. When God places this on our heart, will we rise and run? And number two, will we ask and answer? Will you rise and run? Verse 27, and he, Philip, rose and went, because God told him to. Verse 30, so Philip ran to him. And heard him. Rise and run. Be quick to obey. Isn't this what we teach our children? Be quick to obey. Oh, that we would be the same with God. Quick to obey. I got in my truck this morning and I'm on my way here. I get here early so I can look through sermon notes. And I'm looking at my gas gauge and I'm thinking, man, I should probably get gas, but I got, I got enough. And so I turn the way that wouldn't go to the gas station on my way to church. And all of a sudden, I just feel like you're supposed to go get gas. And I'm thinking about all these sermon notes. I've been not listening to God and trying to obey him. And I thought, God, you tell me to go get gas? I'll go get gas. I turn around, and I start heading to the gas station. And I'm on the drive, and I'm thinking, I know what you're doing. There's going to be somebody there I have to share Jesus with. <laughs> I'm going to preach this this morning, and you want me to go to the gas station. I'm going to rise and run. I'm going. Whatever's there. I get there, there's nobody. Like, nobody. I don't even think there was an attendant. You know, I put in the card. I'm like, okay, Lord, what was that? Whatever. 
I think it was just saying, Dan, I just wanted you to be obedient in the moment. Just rise and go. And if I have something for you next time, you'll be more prepared. Would we just rise and run when God says to? How could Philip do that? How could he just rise and run? Because I think he had a humble confidence. A humble confidence. He was humble in that he knew his own identity. He knew that he was a sinner saved by grace, and he was in need of that every day. That's humility. I need the gospel. But he was also confident. He knew that everybody that would hear the gospel had a need, and he knew that the only answer to that was Jesus, that they too are a sinner in need of Jesus. I am confident of that. I'm humble. I need this, but I'm confident that they need it too. So Philip could rise and run because he believed in the power of the gospel for himself and for others. Humble enough to recognize his own need for the gospel, God can do what I cannot, and confident enough to believe the power of the gospel in another person's life. God can do what they cannot. That's humble confidence. Would we believe that so much? Would we believe the gospel so well that we would never, ever be threatened in moments like this? Because you need the gospel deep inside you to be able to witness. Philip had zero, no relational equity with this Ethiopian. It wasn't like he had said, Hey, I'm Philip. You know, if we could go out to coffee 20 times, then on the 21st time I'll talk about Jesus. He had no relational equity whatsoever. And we talk about building relationships and witnessing to people you know. Awesome. Absolutely. Build relationships. But it doesn't negate the fact that if God says to share the gospel with somebody, it could mean that we have no relationship with them whatsoever. No time to even build it. Philip has one thing in common with this man. They're both God-seekers. And really everybody is. Whatever they're seeking to be fulfilled, to feel whole, they're looking for God. They may not know it, but they are. So he has no relational equity with this Ethiopian. He's a different race. He's a different class, economic status. He likely had a a different mother tongue, probably spoke a second language that they could have in common, different culture. But Philip sees this man, and he sees in him a desire to understand, a drive to fill what is empty. No relational equity, but he's humbly confident that he has what this man needs. He's humbly confident. Why? Because even though he had no relational equity with the Ethiopian, he has full relational equity with Jesus. And that's a relationship that he knows he cannot lose. He is confident of this, that no matter what rejection he might experience in sharing Jesus, no matter what condemnation, no matter what comes back, he knows there's no condemnation for me in Jesus. I am secure in this. I am confident of this. I know that this relationship that I have with Jesus will not be lost no matter what happens when I speak these words right now to this person. So Philip has to find a starting point, like we all do. And maybe the person that we're speaking to has no religious background whatsoever. Maybe they have a tremendous background. Maybe they grew up in the church but have rejected Jesus at this point. But someone once said, the gospel is simple enough for a toddler to wade in and deep enough for an elephant to swim in. (laughs) No matter their starting point, the gospel will give you an entry into it. Whether they understand nothing about it or whether they've heard it a gazillion times. What starting point? What is their felt need? How can I understand this person? Because the gospel is going to speak to that need. And the gospel is not just about meeting a need like that, right? Helping someone to feel better. But it's not a bad starting point if I can understand what their felt need is. 
Maybe they say, I have no need at all. I'm good. I'm fine. Well, then you know their need. (laughs) They're prideful and they need to bend the knee to Jesus. Maybe it's guilt that they have because of what they've done. The gospel speaks to that. Maybe it's shame that they feel because of what's been done to them. The gospel can speak to that. Maybe it's meaningless in life. Loneliness, victimization. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they're experiencing tremendous disappointment. All of these are felt needs that are great entry points for the gospel because the gospel speaks to all of them. What was the Ethiopian's need? He says, I don't understand this. But before that, I wonder if something happened. I wonder if this Ethiopian suffered a setback when he went to Jerusalem. Listen to verses 30 and 31. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? So this Ethiopian eunuch had just gone to the temple in Jerusalem, and there was no one there to guide him? There was no one there to explain what Isaiah was about? That's a setback. The Old Testament law tells us that a eunuch can't even enter into the temple. This guy traveled a long ways, hoping to find what he was looking for, and he gets to the door, and he's rejected. You can't come in. I don't care how much money you got or who you're representing. You can't come in. That is discouraging. So Philip goes into the little, literal wilderness, into that desert place, but he also enters into this man's wilderness of his disappointment, where God is already at work. And Philip said, I'm going to walk through that door. <laughs> so believe the gospel so well that you're not threatened in those moments, and believe that no one, no one is beyond God's reach. Philip's ready in this moment. This man is not beyond God's reach. I know he was disappointed and discouraged and rejected, and he doesn't understand. But Isaiah 59.1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. He can reach even people that seem out of reach, people that are discouraged, that are hurt, that are angry, that are living in shame and in guilt, and they feel like there's no way out of it. I want you to hear now the testimony of someone from our congregation, Madeline Haggard, that demonstrates humble confidence, humble enough to recognize her own need for the gospel in her life in a very traumatic situation, but confident enough to believe the power of the gospel for another's life who you would have thought was far beyond the reach of the gospel. Let's watch that now. and turn it up some. I was born the youngest of four, uh, the result of a rape, um, raised by a single mom, and I lived a very sheltered life until I was about 13. When we moved to another small town about 30 miles away, you know, didn't really have a whole lot of interaction with anybody being in a new town. And so when this older guy um, came over and said, hey, you want to go to my parents' house? I thought, what a great opportunity to get to know somebody and uh, like the attention. So I went with him. But when we got there, His parents were not home, and he took a rifle from above the door and basically locked the door and kept me in there for two and a half days. Um, He was over six feet tall and six years older than I was, and he had a real anger problem. Um, So... There wasn't much I could do except try to stay alive. 
but he decided to let me go. He told me to get into the trunk of his car, so I did, and he drove me to the junior high, and I ran and I ran and I ran and just went to class. Back then, in a small town, you know, nobody asked, why do you have, you know, bloody clothes? Why do you have a bruise on your face? You know, why are you tired looking? Why do you look so fearful? I was stalked um, after that for quite a while, um, letting me know that if I told anyone, he would either kill me or kill my parents. So, of course, I didn't tell anyone. Um, I physically, tangibly felt fear. I took a pregnancy test. I was pregnant at 13 years old. And um, I just remember her saying, bless her heart, she was just trying to help her, her child. But she said, we just have to get rid of it and let you live your life, let your life go on. I didn't even know what it was. So um, we had to go to another town that did uh, midterm abortions. After that was done, nothing else was ever said about it again. Three years later, um, we decided to move to Virginia. And I thought, okay, great. It's a, a good time to get away. And, uh, you know, maybe I can shake this and get away from him. Um, I started to take a childcare class at the Votech Center here locally. And that's really when spaghetti hit the fan. And I just couldn't handle it. I mean, it, it was just too much for me to handle. And um, at the same time, all of my family members were uh, coming to Christ. You know, I was just watching them thinking, wow, they're not like they used to be. They're better than they used to be. What is this, you know, Jesus thing? And so um, my mom shared the love of Christ with me for six months and um, I couldn't really understand how someone could <clears throat> forgive anyone no matter what you've done and I couldn't understand how he could love me. But I finally surrendered my life to Christ. And I tell you, the clouds were whiter, the sky was bluer. It was, it was a miracle. And so uh, I just kept learning more and more about Christ and enjoying this new life of freedom because everything went away. The guilt, the shame, one day we were in the kitchen and the phone rang and it was this guy and of course he was trying to be intimidating and things like that and i just said you know this is why this is why i'm not afraid of you <laughs> and i shared the gospel with him and um, he didn't say anything he just listened and listened and I said do you want to pray because the same God who saved me can save you too and so we prayed and he he never called back I never heard from him again you know the the, the perpetrator the person who had so much evil in him the same forgiveness was for him that, that was for me, that was for you, that was for anybody. And you alone can rescue, you alone can save, you... 
Wow, right? <laughs> By showing that video, I just want to say I am not in any way asking anyone here who has ever suffered abuse uh, to witness to your abuser. Okay, that is a process that, uh, that would take some guidance and is really between you and the Lord, all right? So I didn't show that for that reason. Uh, Madeline was given the grace to do so, obviously. Uh, she humbly recognized her own need, and she believed so earnestly the power of the gospel to reach anyone, to reach anyone. To me, that is so powerful. Do I believe that much? Am I humble enough to recognize my own need? And do I believe the power of the gospel enough to reach anyone? The first thing we saw from Philip was to rise and to run when God says to. And then the next thing, the second thing, ask and answer. So I'll read the rest of this passage, verse 30 through 35. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep who was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens up not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and began with this scripture, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus. He asked the question, Do you understand? That's a great question. I'll ask you that this morning. As I'm exhorting you and encouraging you to share Jesus with other people, do you understand? Do you understand the gospel? Could you have a gospel conversation? Could you communicate the gospel to somebody? We have been using as our benediction in this series, 1 uh, Corinthians 9, 22 and 23. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. May that be true, as we will read it again at the end of this service. Do we know how to have a gospel conversation? Do we know what the gospel is? I mean, it is the whole story of the Bible. So we could say it is creation. God made everything perfect. It is fall. It is man rebelled and decided to go his own way and separated himself from God. It is redemption. God came to earth as Jesus to walk among us and make a way back to the Father by dying and being rose raised again. It is restoration that one day all things will be restored and made new. So it is creation, fall, redemption, restoration, but that's a big picture. It might be hard to even keep that in mind. Paul made it very simple at the end of his letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 when he said, I want to remind you of the gospel that I've shared with you. That is, Jesus died for your sin, according to the scripture. Jesus was buried and raised from the dead, according to the scripture. And he goes on. It's like, there it is. There's the gospel. Jesus died for your sin, and Jesus rose to new life. Everybody's going to die. Unless Jesus comes back, so be it. That'd be great. Everybody's going to die. And you'll either die in your sin, or you'll die in Jesus. Jesus was raised from the dead. You know what? Everybody will experience a resurrection at some point. You will be either resurrected in your sin or you'll be resurrected in Jesus. This is the gospel. You will die and you will face God. But Jesus has made a way. Jesus has made a way. So you need fear that never again if you're in Christ. And maybe it's just a simple verse. If you can't remember any other verse to help point people to Jesus, everybody knows John 3, 16, right? You at least know it enough that you could look it up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, but have everlasting life. There it is, the death 
and the resurrection themes again. One thing is for sure, no matter what you know, you have to open your mouth. Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth. No one comes to Jesus without hearing, or at least reading, receiving the gospel through words. And so Philip had this advantage that he could begin with this scripture that the Ethiopian was reading. What was he reading? Isaiah. Beginning with this scripture, Philip was able to build a path to Jesus. Oh, that we would be able to do that. Build a path to Jesus from wherever we start with somebody. So the Ethiopian read, In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who is this about? And I can just imagine Philip in that moment pausing and saying, Can you tell me about your experience in Jerusalem? Can you tell me about your experience at the temple? And you can hear the Ethiopian saying, it was humiliating. I couldn't get in. I was denied. I was rejected. Oh, Philip's like, let me tell you who this is about. The one who was denied and rejected and faced humiliation. The one that Isaiah, the same prophet you're reading, says was despised and rejected. That Isaiah said would also be the way that God would make a way in the wilderness, just like we're right here in the wilderness right now. Philip's building a path to Jesus from where this guy is. Oh, that we would be able to do the same. Ask questions. Find out where people are on their journey and then point them to Jesus. Ask and answer. It was Peter who said, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. Now, this assumes that they see hope in you. Are we people of hope? Even in our own wilderness, because remember the first sermon said, go into other people's wilderness and point to Jesus, and the second sermon in this series said, let them into your wilderness. Let them see that in your struggles of life, you have hope. G.K. Chesterton said, hope means hoping when things are hopeless, or it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is mere flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. Would they see that our hope is firm, confidently in Jesus? And I'll add this. You can share hope through your testimony, and that's good and powerful. We heard that from Madeline. But your testimony is not the gospel. It might be an entryway to the gospel, but your testimony in and of itself is not the gospel. It's evidence of the power of the gospel. So please do share your testimony. But you eventually need to take people to the gospel. Philip answers the question of 34, about whom I ask does the prophet speak, with verse 35. He opens his mouth and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. He speaks of Jesus. We have but one hope, we have but one gospel. And it is what we need to give to people, no matter what else we're sharing with them. And you can do this in a lot of different ways. Just like there's different paintings of the same subject that look very different, right? Look at Picasso's horse. It's going to look different than Salvador Dali's horse, which will be like flopped over a tree. Or Van Gogh's horse or Rembrandt's horse. But they're all a horse. Matthew paints his gospel regally with royal colors because he's presenting this idea of entering the kingdom of God through Jesus. John paints his gospel very serenely because he's painting a picture of receiving peace and eternal life in Jesus. Paul in his epistles is bold with his colors because he paints the picture of God becoming sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Jesus. Peter, very evenly, as he paints a picture of everyone standing on equal ground before God in Jesus. James paints very action-oriented with lots of activity because he paints a picture of mercy triumphing over judgment through Jesus. But the content of the gospel is always the same. It's Jesus. It's about him. 
the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the future coming of Jesus. One gospel that is not a moral code for people to live by. It's not what we do. Any religion can offer that. It is what Jesus has done alone and our faith in that. So avoid putting works before faith. Don't put the works cart before the faith cart. When you're talking to somebody and it's just like, man, you need to get your life together. You really should be doing this. You really should stop doing that. All right? There may be things they need to start doing and stop doing, but that's not the gospel. No one can turn from sin. No one can turn from the effects of sin unless they turn to Jesus. This is the gospel. He lived the life that we could not. He paid the debt that we could not. And he offers a secure future that we could never, ever attain on our own. This is what the Ethiopian heard. And this changed his life. And this man had a legacy. And I'll close with this. God predicted in Psalm 68, 31, Cush shall hasten to stretch out her hands to God. Cush would later become Ethiopia. Here it is, this Cushite, this Ethiopian man, reaching his hands out to God, being rejected at the temple, but God sending Philip to interact with him in an inconvenient, possibly uncomfortable time that could have been awkward, but he does it anyways. And the result is that the gospel goes to the end of the known world at that time. It travels back with an Ethiopian to the headwaters of the Blue Nile River, And Ethiopia, by the 4th century, becomes the first known official Christian nation in the world. Inconvenient, uncomfortable, awkward moment that started a movement that became a monument to God's ability to go where we cannot, to do what we cannot. This is the gospel. That Jesus died for your sin, and he rose again from the grave to give you life. This is what we share. What do we learn from Philip? That he embraced the awkward, that he obeyed God's call quickly. He rose and he ran. What do we learn from Philip? That he met people right where they were at, and he was willing to ask and answer questions. Oh, that we would share the good news of Jesus in these awkward moments.